session of AAM 2020. Um, first up, we've got Kathy Campbell from New Zealand, um, and she's uh, continuing our Exploration for Life Mars and Beyond session. So we've got a few more talks in that session, and then we'll be having our first rapid fire session, which will be uh, a number of shorter talks. And then our invited speaker session with Sarah Jane Moore. Um, so I'd like to invite Kathy uh, now to share her screen. Um, just get that set up. Yep. Great. So just a reminder, everyone, um, as well, um, post any comments you have in the chat and we can ask those at the end of each talk. Um, a reminder to the speakers, I'll give you a quick uh, wa uh, warning with one minute to go, so at 11 minutes, just so we uh, make sure we've got enough time for questions. Um, we are having um, a parallel uh, kind of informal networking and discussion uh, in Slack. So I'll post the link in the chat for that. Um, so feel free to, to take your discussions to that platform as well. Um, we also have a world map um, showing where all of the participants from AAM are from. So please share um, a picture or, or a, a drop of the location pin for where you're from so we can just see um, the huge variety of people, uh, sorry, huge variety of locations that people are joining us from. Um, so it's just ticked over to 12.30, so I might shut my screen off and let you take it away, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Kia ora, everyone. Well, I just wanted to briefly, for those of you who don't know uh, me and my team, we are a group of mainly geologists, microbiologists, and geochemists who are interested in life signatures and settings as recorded in the geological record. I'm one of the geologists and um, as relevant to early Earth and Mars. So I'll, I'll just get right underway. And oh, and just wanted to mention that we are a team that works in New Zealand, Australia. Uh, we've got a group from Minnesota, France, Japan, and Argentina. So this may be familiar to many of you. I'm, I'm not entirely sure how many of you keep up with uh, the geology of Mars, and thanks, Joe, for that um, great overview. Uh, this is an area of Mars Gusev Crater that was studied by Spirit Rover in the 2000s. And this particular area in Columbia Hills at home plate uh, turns out to be quite relevant for the work that we do because here is Spirit Re uh, Rover in its resting place. And you can see alongside of this light toned uh, material, ashy material of home plate is an area outlined and uh, dashed by Ruff et al um, that shows areas of silica rich nodular outcrops on the ground. And of course we have the benefit of the rover. So this is not remote sensed in the sense that the rover was driving around here and um, found these deposits. And you can see that with you, you look at the yellow arrows here, you see that they are stratiform, they're layered. And um, they overlie a light tone platy unit that is interpreted as an as a acid altered, acid sulfate alteration of an ash, of a volcanic ash. And so this is the subject of what I wanna talk about today is these silica rich nodular outcrops also known as digitate features because they look like your digits or finger like features that were found uh, by the rover. So um, that's the important aspect and Steve Ruff uh, and Jack Farmer in particular published um, what I consider to be a, a watershed uh, paper in 2016 uh, comparing this Martian nodular material with uh, hot spring deposits at El Tateo in Chile, which are in the high Andes, high elevation, uh, highly arid, uh, low volume of silica, and actually opaline rich and salt rich. Uh, and instruments on the rover um, show that um, looking at thermal emission uh, spectra show us that in fact, the deposits at El Tateo uh, match almost exactly uh, these silica rich outcrops on Mars. And so the overall interpretation and more recently um, published in Astrobiology this year in 2020 with Steve and, and our, our team uh, interprets these deposits as hot spring related. 
Importantly, in the Rough and Farmer paper of 2016, they uh, showed that certainly the El Tatio examples are known to be stromatolites, in fact, microstromatolites, which are layered uh, microbial mats, and in this case, silica, that's um, being precipitated on these features that are being deposited in these very shallow uh, discharge channels from these hot springs. And so what we know from Earth in this closest Martian analog uh, is that these are buildups um, that are at least templated um, with microbes uh, and they're sedimentary and they're highly layered, finely layered, known as laminated. What we don't know about the Martian material is whether they're laminated and of course whether they contain biosignatures. So this site uh, was one of the three finalists in the Mars 2020 landing site selection and as you know um, the Perseverance and uh, is going to a delta but we are strong advocates for hydrothermal settings for preserving uh, potential biosignatures on Mars because the silica preserves the microbial mats in C2. So there's no real question of where the organics might be coming from. So our team decided to go to New Zealand since this is where we work and take a look around the hot springs of New Zealand in the central volcanic zone. And lo and behold, of course, there are digitate uh, silica structures in many locations. They range, and that's what I'm really focusing on today. They range um, uh, in terms of their morphologies from rather nodular to spicular, which is just a high uh, length to width aspect ratio of these deposits. And you can see them in these very shallow discharge uh, channels and sometimes also around the rims of these hot springs all over the central uh, North Island volcanic zone area, sort of centered on Rotorua and other areas, the AAM of 2018 um, visited some of these locations. So in purple dots, you can see our sampling locations and we chose them on purpose as a, they're a range of pHs, a range of temperatures and um, forming at the air water interface because this is a great place to start to study the context of these similar deposits to El Tatio, but with easy access. We're not at 4,300 meters altitude in the middle of the Andes. We have coffee shops and places to stay and a whole team of students and um, people interacting with us. So we've started uh, work on these um, hot spring deposits in this project called that was called Rotorua on Mars uh, that was funded here at the University of Auckland. So, the uh, first part of that work has actually been published by our PhD student microbiologist Kitty Shriaporn, who can't, couldn't be here today. Um, and we have a range of chemistries. You can see the El Tatio chemistry is an alkali chloride um, deposits uh, uh, of uh, spring waters, but we have a range of chemistries of acid sulfate, acid sulfate bicarbonate uh, type of waters and alkali chloride waters. So we have these digitate features and they've been looked at uh, from a molecular point of view. Um, we have their biomarkers being looked at uh, by Maiva Mian and um, we are doing the geological context and I'll be focusing on, on some of those aspects here. So this work was published in 2020, Shreya Porn et al. in Geobiology. And I will give you a very brief overview just so you can see um, that the spicular or nodular deposits are full of life. It doesn't matter what temperature, it doesn't matter what chemistry. So if you wanna see how to read this chart easily, the temperature range of, these are all the different sites of the different springs. And they're arranged from uh, acid sulfate on the left and then alkaline on the right. And the pH is from low pH to high pH from left to right. And then the temperature ranges, you can see there's sort of more high temperature ones here on the left and then more moderate temperature ones on the right. And I'll just point out a few highlights. And if you would like more details, please refer to the paper or I can put you in touch with our two microbiologists on the team or three microbiologists on the team. And what you can see in the alkali chloride springs for sure is that we have uh, a, a dominance of cyanobacteria and flexi, uh, chloroflexi uh, bacteria and um, not seen really so much elsewhere. And when you look at the acid uh, sulfate bicarbonate springs, they're highly variable in there. They have a high diversity of microorganisms. And then the acidic ones are kind of dominated by uh, these four groups down here, uh, shown here. And they, um, Kitty's doing some additional work on some of the wide ranging taxa. Why are, they, why are they so ubiquitous, particularly in these acidic springs? And then orange spring, which is over here on the right, is just a plain strange one because it's full of iron and um, cooked organics. It's off of this place called Kerosene Creek and it's, um, itself is quite highly unusual.
So there's uh, one thing that definitely has come out of the work is that life is found everywhere in all the settings. So it doesn't matter whether say the Martian deposits were alkali chloride springs or whether they were acid sulfate springs. And so um, this is from our uh, work in preparation, looking at the different um, uh, spicular nodular materials, seeing that they're all layered and, and seeing also that they're full of different kinds of microbes. Um, what I would point out is that they're all uh, laminated. And this is the uh, alkali chloride nodular material. They, um, based on experimental work, previous work we've done, they form by wicking and the microbes are templates upon which silica forms. So a zoom in here of the um, alkali chloride spring, you can see this palisade microbial fabric. This is the most recent layer that was forming on this um, material before we sampled it. And below here is a silicified um, mat and a stromatolite growing up in this nodular or finger-like fabric. So we're looking at this in a bit more detail. Um, some of these photographs were taken quite recently. Now, when you get into the geological record, you're often working in older rocks with thin sections of rocks. And so here are some acid sulfate examples from our modern study. And you start looking for things like these uh, dark laminated structures that are quite crenulated or very, very wrinkly on a fine scale. Or you look for um, microbial degassing structures with network fabrics. That's another kind of microbial fabric. And here's an acidic um, palisade fabric. But these can start to kind of disappear into the rock as it ages and turns to quartz the silica turns to quartz. But if you use, in particular, I'd advocate using Raman techniques and Raman mapping like we did in this study that was published this year, looking at the very, very high temperature biofilms that form in geyserites, which are a type of microstromatolite, a type of digitate material. And you can see with Raman mapping all the carbon in these microbial laminates in 150 million year old geyserite from Patagonia. So these can be well preserved, um, but we're really interested in this as we take it back further and further into the record as one of our PhD students will talk about later today, Michaela Dobson, looking at 3.5 billion year old rocks. We advocate um, use of Raman mapping where possible because you don't always have the filaments preserved. Um, we're in the middle, we went out and mapped all of these things uh, in a geological sense. Uh, for those of you who are not geologists, uh, facies mapping is a way to map out the different characteristic rock types and textures uh, in these rocks. And this is just one of the maps, an alkali chloride spring on the left and an acid spring on the right. And we're very, very interested in the context of the spicular material, which is pink in both examples. So where we find the spicules in the outflow channel of this one is just here in one small area. But over on the right in this particular acid spring, we find uh, the spicular or nodular material all over the place, often associated with much higher temperatures. And so it looks like it might be random, but in fact, we're beginning to find patterns in the lithologies or the rock types around these spicular deposits. We're interested in not only documenting variability, but also what is predictable in these systems so that when you go out and map an ancient deposit on Earth that isn't, that doesn't have this geomorphology or one on Mars where you're wondering, is it really a hot spring? Then it, we think it's very important to have these geological context analog maps, which we're um, currently analyzing and hope to um, publish on later this year. So that's important to understand that there is both variability and predictability in these facies models. And facies are the aspect of the rock that tell you something about the environment. Um, so I want to just wrap up then with a couple of um, recommendations besides the importance of mapping both at the scale of the rover driving around where you might be picking up samples and wondering what, it, what should be over there, what would I predict if this is a hot spring, um, to the sort of fine scale, thank you, nearly done, to the, to the really fine scale um, understanding of what's going on, and that is that I really advocate more growth experiments. Um, this work was done um, by Kim Handley, a microbiologist. Uh, at Champagne Pool, which is a very famous uh, hot spring in New Zealand. And she was able to show very clearly that all the layers in these rocks, not just the filamentous layers, but even the solid uh, layers are all formed by microbial activity. That's very important to document that. And the best way to do that is to grow the center. So I'm advocating for that and it's very involved. We had a weather station and it was monitored, you know, 24 seven. So it's not something that you can do easily up at El Tatio. Uh, and a question is, can digitate fabrics be grown abiotically is a question that is still open and is being actively researched. Final slide here. Um, we also have the question of how easy or hard would it be to collect these silica nodules in a Mars sample return mission, either to Columbia Hills, which we are advocating, or another location. 
And here you can see from Ruff's work uh, with the Spirit rover where the rover drove over uh, the silica nodules, they were undisturbed here, whereas the um, volcanic rocks were definitely disturbed by the wheels driving over. Uh, and in this area here, they actively and on purpose knock these silica nodules over to take a look at them. So uh, one of our future projects will be to do experimental work with um, rover-like or collecting-like um, apparatus to see if across the board in our New Zealand examples, whether um, we, we range from these things where it's easy to pick them up and some that are so hard cemented that you have to whack them out with a chisel and a rock hammer. And one of the questions we were asked in the landing site selection was, how do you know you can sample these things with a rover? Is it gonna be possible? And so we'll be doing hopefully some field and experimental work on that uh, coming up in the future. So on that note, I'll wrap up and hope um, you uh, had a chance to at least see some of these hydrothermal silica deposits and their potential as biosignatures, both for early Earth and also early Mars. Thanks. Thank you, Kathy. That was a really great presentation and some f fantastic um, images of the various um, textures in, in Sinter deposits. Um, we have a question from Andre. Uh, while I read that out, Dimitra, are you okay to set up your screen ready for the presentation? Um, so from Andre, given that microbes act as templates for min mineral deposition, do you see any noticeable morphological differences in the mineral induced by differences in the structures of the original microbes or microbial communities? So we're limited by, you know, what minerals are precipitating out of springs. Uh, and a lot of work has been done around the world on silica. Uh, there are also travertines, which are carbonate, and they don't preserve as well unless they are silicified early. Silica seems to be this incredible inert material that if it comes out of the spring, it kind of locks everything in. But there, we, are, we are also extremely interested in replacement uh, minerals. Um, for example, anatase, which is a titanium oxide mineral that seems to be attracted to organics. And we've already seen this in the Jurassic material from Patagonia that a lot of the microbial mats are replaced with anatase. So there could be biosignatures that are super robust that are actually replacive but have not destroyed the, um, the laminated fabrics. So I could get into that a little bit more, but basically there are sort of a certain number of um, mineral types that seem to be recurring, especially in volcanic terrains. Silica, carbonate, and titanium oxide are three that I can list uh, briefly here. Great. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you. Uh, if you have any further questions for Kathy or any of our other speakers in this Mars session, uh, feel free to head over to the Slack channel and there's um, a Mars Beyond uh, sub channel there where you can um, ask and discuss all these extra questions. So next up we have Dimitra, um, who's going to talk about exploring the possibility of subsurface life on Mars and hopefully touch a little bit on uh, radiation as well. So take it away. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Thanks for the intro introduction. Thank you for all the organize organizers for uh, this. Uh, it's very early in the morning here in Abu Dhabi. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I am an astrophysicist and I will be looking at uh, the possibility of finding life uh, below the surface of Mars from an astrophysical perspective. Uh, so New York University, uh, over the past uh, a decade or so has expanded. It has two more campuses in addition to New York. It has now a campus in Abu Dhabi and Shanghai. And now I'm based in Abu Dhabi. Um, recently, uh, UAE launched uh, its first interplanetary mission, the Hope Mars mission. Many of you must know about this. And my research is uh, primarily now based on Mars, uh, studying the Martian atmosphere uh, with the HOPE probe. Uh, I study how radiation interacts with different planets and the possibility of finding life with it. So this is going to certainly help with that kind of analysis. Um, we are also associated with the human spaceflight program and we are uh, setting up experiments to uh, do research on board the International Space Station. We have a number of students working with us uh, uh, in this type of research. And in fact, Caitlin MacArthur from New Zealand is going to give a talk about how radiation interacts with human beings and uh, 
what are the implications of uh, health effects uh, on astronauts and long term missions for example missions to mars so she'll be giving a short talk uh, just in a bit so let us start with the search for life and this is uh, as you know a mandatory slide in an astrobiology talk we talk about habitable zones uh, we know about a number of extrasolar planets and uh, just by calculating the flux of radiation uh, falling on uh, the planet we can make estimates whether that planet would uh, fall in the habitable zone or not and as you can see in the solar system uh, only earth lies in the habitable zone because earth is used as the definition to calculate that and mars obviously as you can see lies outside the habitable zone uh, which wasn't the, always the case many people believe uh, that there is no life on mars uh, i am not one of those people i think we still have to look for uh, evidence so the search for life on mars uh, this has been going on for a very very long time starting from science fiction to uh, many theories to actual missions going there taking measurements this audience knows uh, a lot about it the viking missions and uh, everything after that so I'm, i won't go into great detail but the overall picture of mars is we have is that uh, several billion year, years ago it was very earth like it had liquid water on its surface we had water bodies and so one good picture that hey we had uh, we have life on earth there might be a possibility that uh, life uh, could have existed there now the question is if it ever existed uh, can we find it somewhere can we find ev evidence of extinct or extinct life Now today's picture, as you all know, is that Mars is extremely cold and dry. It has a very thin atmosphere, about two percent column density, and it does not have any intrinsic magnetic field. So it means that uh, all the radiation from galactic cosmic rays, all the harmful solar radiation, X-rays, ultraviolet, there is very little protection from it, and uh, that is why. Uh, there is been no detection of life on the surface because the radiation load on the surface is extremely high now the question is what about the subsurface environment which is protected from all this harsh radiation and this question has never been uh, explored with any of uh, the robotic missions and uh, european space agency and roscosmos had planned to launch a mission uh, called exomars uh, 2020 it was supposed to be launched uh, this july august but just like many things are going downhill in uh, 2020 this mission got delayed too and so this mission is now scheduled for a launch in 22 it has uh, this rover which you can see it is the rosalind franklin rover it has a drill capable of drilling 2 meters below the surface uh, about 6 feet and uh, one of the main objectives of the mission is to uh, look for signs of life there and so you can just go and find details about uh, this mission very exciting mission so this got me thinking that hey you have this shallow subsurface environment on mars uh, what can we predict uh, what kind of environment it would have what kind of life could survive there and so in order to do that we have to look at the the main radiation source on the surface in in the subsurface which is galactic cosmic rays or gcrs so this might look uh, if you're not a physicist this might not make much sense to you on the vertical axis you have just the flux of these high energy protons on the horizontal axis you have this energy uh, now visible light is measured uh, has energy between 2 and 3 electron volts and here on the horizontal axis you see the unit star with 1 gev which is uh, a billion times more energetic roughly than visible light so it is extremely energetic radiation and as the energy goes up the flux also drops and so when this radiation this extremely energetic radiation interacts with the martian atmosphere which is very thin it is not stopped it goes and penetrates several meters below the surface 
Uh, now we want to model this and in order to do that we use this tool called geon core it is uh, a model used uh, at CERN that simulates uh, the collision of high energy particles and it was used uh, to do analysis for the discovery of the higgs boson so i have modified this code to work with different planets uh, and um, i have modified to work with mars and I take these measurements of uh, this radiation of galactic cosmic rays. I use this model to uh, propagate uh, how these charged particles interact with the atmosphere and propagate below the surface. On the right, you can see how this uh, shower of all the particles. So the primary particle generates a lot of secondary particles, which generate more particles. So you have this kind of a shower. Uh, and we then model its interaction with the Martian regolith. Uh, it has embedded ice organics, as you all know. And the question is, okay, what would happen if, uh, what is happening um, below the surface? Now, this model has to be calibrated somehow. So uh, on the left, you see this NASA has a Curiosity rover on the surface of Mars. It has a detector called the Radiation Assessment Detector RAD, and it measures radiation dose. And so at any point in time, we, we know the flux of galactic cosmic rays, we have this measurement. So we can validate our model uh, and uh, we can uh, it predict exactly how much radiation is there. And once we have that prediction, we know that our calculations are accurate for below the surface. Um, now the question is, we have all these calculations can we predict the possibility of life can we make these calculations and uh, as a physicist as it is extremely frustrating that we we cannot uh, we don't have a basic underlying theory through which we can do calculations and figure out uh, how you know basic building blocks uh, of matter or basic building blocks of life uh, how how can they uh, suddenly uh, become alive and so we have to do some analog studies. And so the question, more relevant question is that can any extremophile survive in such conditions? And uh, this is a huge uh, field of research. And so this expands the definition of habitability that we should look at the microbial uh, habitability. And so these extreme environments are defined by humans. Uh, there could be several habitats within the solar system where these extreme files could survive. And so we should uh, look for different types of habitats in the solar system and look for potential for life and also design missions which could go and detect these things. So I am going to uh, focus on this uh, extremophile. It is called D-sulfuridus aviator or the gold mine bug. It is a bacterium. It is found 2.8 kilometers deep in a South African gold mine. Uh, it obviously, because of its great depth, it does not have access to any photons. And uh, uh, there are very uh, small amount of oxygen, very small amount of water now the interesting thing is this mine is radioactive and this organism survives in a highly radioactive environment um, so this got me thinking that hey can this be used as a model to predict life below the surface so this is a more detailed um, uh, chart of uh, what is exactly happening. So right uh, in the middle, you can see that you have these radioactive substances, they emit alpha, beta, gamma radiation, and which damages the organism too, but they interact with the surrounding medium, start a series of chemical reactions. And these chemical products are then used by that organism to power its metabolism. You can see you have sulfates, H2O2, uh, hydrogen production and uh, this uh, organism is completely able to uh, survive uh, using uh, these chemical products so the question is uh, whether such a mechanism could work on mars and so the idea is that you have instead of having radioactive substances uh, produce uh, um, causing uh, these chemical reactions, you have the flux of galactic cosmic rays below the surface, 
And so, the, as I told you, that UV is blocked on the surface, galactic cosmic rays can penetrate deeper. So, below the surface, they will induce chemical reactions. And uh, the energy uh, goes down as they propagate below the surface. So, closer to the surface, uh, it could damage the organism uh, as we move uh, further below. Uh, the amount of damage uh, is lower, so the organism can withstand uh, that radiation and also use all the different uh, chemical products. So I did these calculations with the model. I calculated the energy deposition rate, which is on the vertical axis uh, or on the horizontal axis of the depth. And the green band is the amount of energy which is available to this gold mine bug in South Africa. And so a similar amount of energy is available for chemical products uh, at a depth of 1.2 meters, uh, according to this model. Uh, now, uh, what, what are the different chemical products? So these ga galactic cosmic rays are going to induce radiolysis, uh, which is a combination of ionization, excitation, dissociation. Uh, it will uh, start a series of uh, radiochemical reactions. Uh, it produces both oxidants and reductants, which are both for metabolic, vital for uh, metabolic reactions. Uh, there are pockets where you have abundant CO2 and water ice. Uh, CO2, H2 radiation chemistry would produce several organic compounds such as CH4, H2, CO3, and so on. Uh, one good thing is that because of low temperatures, uh, you have slow redox reactions, which means oxidized species can coexist with reduced species. And the idea is that life potentially would be able to catalyze these reactions, which otherwise are inhibited at such low temperatures. And so I have detailed all the calculations and all these processes. I didn't have enough time to talk about them in this paper recently published in scientific reports where I argued that you have galactic cosmic rays, they can uh, induce chemical disequilibrium in the Martian subsurface environment. And whether or not it can be used for metabolic activity is an open question. Uh, so, uh, the take home message is that uh, you have galactic cosmic rays uh, on the surface of Mars, uh, very well measured, we can model them accurately. Uh, we have calculated how they are going to propagate below the surface, uh, they can be a source of the chemical disequilibrium. Uh, they will enhance the production of electrons, uh, which can be used by life. We have radiolytic production of uh, hydrogen, sulfates, etc. Uh, if you're interested, please, please go and look at this paper. And this Rosalind Franklin rover is going to explore that area and uh, tell us whether uh, this is true or not. And with that, thanks a lot. That's great, thank you. And thanks also for getting up so early to share your research with us. Um, just for time, we might move the questions and discussion to the chat. There's a couple of questions there for you if you're happy sure. to um, answer them. Sure, sure. Thank you. Um, so next up we have Martin van Kranendonk and he's gonna chat to us about the Pilbara's role, Pilbara's role in the search for life on Mars. And also um, a little bit about uh, STEM, the next generation STEM stars. So Martin, take it away. Thanks. Hello everyone. Can you see uh, my screen, Erica? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity and um, it's lovely to see everybody from around the traps uh, tuning in. It's, um, it's a great opportunity under these conditions to have a shared experience. And I think that's vitally important in these days. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the Pilbara and how we've been able to utilize its natural resources for a shared experience uh, through field trips and how that can lead to inspiration for students and people from all walks of life. So um, one of the key things, sorry, let me just see if this is going to... All right, I'm not getting it to um, move. One of the, yeah, so this is the idea of um, 
under the current conditions. But this is true uh, more generally, I think, that we're all interested in having connections. And that can be physical, mental, or emotional. And ideally, that's best when it's all combined together. Uh, of course, these days, the physical aspect is more difficult, but we can still engage uh, in a mental shared experience as we're doing with these talks. And to some degree, if you can travel to places and have a shared experience, you get an emotional connection, not only with your um, study subject, but also with the people that you engage in the research with. So how can some dusty old rocks in the Pilbara sort of help us um, make some connections? Well, I think we've got two things going for us. Um, one is that the field of astrobiology really helps us connect through some of the most fundamental questions that we have. Where did I come from? Are we alone in the universe? Those are great topics for thinking, discussing, sharing ideas about, and uh, undertaking research towards a better understanding. Uh, in the Pilbara, we're very lucky that we're naturally endowed with some of the best, oldest preserved on life on Earth. And um, as summarized in a book chapter that's just coming out um, in the next few months by Dorothy Euler on called Mars Enigmas, we've summarized the different habitats that are available in the Pilbara. And you can see a range of them here, but essentially from rocks that are 3.5 up to 2.7, we have a wide variety of, of life in habitats that range from land to sea and down into the subsurface. In fact, we've identified that there are nine distinct environments, including hot springs on land, deep marine environments, uh, sabkas, shallow marine shelves, and lacustrine environments, to name but a few. And it's that richness and that depth of record that has always been intriguing to people looking at life on Mars, because these can be used as a guide or thinking about where to go to look for life on Mars. And of course, the exciting thing about the age of the rocks is that you can see that red oval circle on this timeline of Mars evolution produced by Bethany Ullman and others in 2016, that the left-hand um, side of that red oval incorporates a period when there were still outfall channels active, there was still water, there was still volcanism, there are still those components that were right, perhaps, for the generation of life, but they were after the last of the very large impact basins. So that window of about 3.5, preserved well here on Earth, and exposed on Mars is that interesting overlap that makes the Pilbara so valuable. We decided, and this was really a, a trip whose outline was, uh, was guided by Mitch Schulte from NASA. He'd been on a uh, previous of one of our trips and thought that the, uh, the way you know, was presented and, and the things you could see were really valuable. And so we decided then um, last year to bring the instrument science teams for both NASA Mars 2020 and the European Space Agency's ExoMars programs into the field to have a shared experience on the rocks and actually look what ancient traces of life look like in the field. Now it's not Mars, there's grass and trees and stuff, but the rocks are red uh, and they contain these ancient traces that it may be exactly what they're looking for with the, uh, the rovers that are on their way or due to go to Mars. And so one of the great things about the field is it relaxes people. It allows them to be themselves and to enjoy not only the rocks, but the sensual experience of being outdoors in an incredible environment. So, and it also develops ways of interacting with people that you would not normally have through a formal discussion session or otherwise. Here you can see a PhD student, industry geologist, and some NASA scientists and ESA scientists relaxing in a billabong. And you know, that allows for discussions to happen and to share a common experience like that is really something that people remember their entire lives. The other really important thing I want to stress here is that we've always taken the approach to be really open and inclusive and to bring as many people into the field as possible because you never actually know where your next great idea is going to come from or who has the idea of something you haven't thought about or seen before. And so I like these pictures. We had um, uh, the great thing and then what leads into the next part about the next generation STEM stars is that a couple of my PhD students organized a field trip for indigenous high school kids to come out to the field 
and meet the, the NASA and, and the ESA program and mission scientists. And so here's a couple of guys signing NASA hats for, uh, for a couple of the students. And you can see that the light on their faces, the chance to meet these, these people in an informal setting out in the field was really wonderful. And here you can see a, a wider view of the interaction that we had with high school teachers. Uh, we had news presenters. We had like a whole gaggle of people. It was really a wonderful high energy event. And then Bonnie and Luke took the students out on their own so that they could have their own experience without the cameras and everything on the old rocks and experience it for themselves. It was really an amazing event. And so what I want to show for you, and, and I'm going to stop sharing this screen, but show you another screen, is that this was then covered by um, by the news. And um, uh, it was a really wonderful event. And I'll just um, bring up another screen. This one here. Red, foggy, and unforgivably harsh. Australia's dry, dusty interior could be mistaken for Mars. Thank you. 
Okay, just let me get back to the original um, screen. So uh, the other thing I wanted to um, talk about, just let me get, it's just gonna take a second for this to, uh, oops. Uh, Erica, can I just ask, is the um, PowerPoint now showing again? Yeah, the PowerPoint's showing. We can see your mouse as well. Yeah. For some reason, it's not going down the page. You might have to use your keyboard arrows. Sometimes the mouse doesn't respond to change the slide. Yeah, thanks. So one of the great things that's uh, followed on from this kind of event, and um, I think it's interesting to, to, to think about that idea of inclusiveness. The more people you get in, the more that your research um, gets spread around. And that doesn't have to be just among scientists. It can really be the general public. And um, one thing that's been very satisfying to me is that the opportunities that we've had with our uh, wonderful natural endowment has allowed the students that I've had to get involved in public outreach. And so you can just see here a couple of examples. Um, we had some of our students uh, participate in uh, our science show Catalyst, a program and they went down to New Zealand with Kathy's group and they talked about uh, origin of life in hot springs. Tara Jokic, a PhD student of mine who just graduated um, earlier this year, she was invited to give a TEDx talk that now has almost a million views, fantastic opportunity. And uh, Bonnie's been interviewed on uh, Triple J and uh, she and Luke have now set up uh, their own uh, website, uh, which is called Praxical, which is a series of workshops that can be done by students. And it really followed on from that opportunity to get involved with the Indigenous students up in the Pilbara, where they presented some science activities. And, you know, people said, oh, wow, this is just wonderful. We don't really get this in our teachings. And so that inspired them to get involved. So I think one of the, one of the great things is that you can share your science across platforms and with a whole variety of people. And uh, I think I just wanna really emphasize that idea of, of being engaged, taking opportunities, and um, sharing your research with as many people as, as possible. And so I'll end it there. I'd like to thank my um, co-authors on this paper, uh, Mitch from NASA headquarters, who we heard from this morning, and uh, Luke and Bonnie, who are in the midst of their PhDs and, and moving on to bigger and better things as they're doing their studies. So thanks very much. Thanks, Martin. And, and sorry, everyone, we had a little bit of issues with the audio there. Um, but if you couldn't hear the um, full video that Martin shared, we posted the link in the Zoom chat to the side. Um, so definitely check it out. It's a really cool summary of um, that trip that they put together. So next up, we have the, our first rapid fire session. So um, Marta, if you're there, you're welcome to set up. Hello, you're welcome to set up your screen ready while I just um, give an overview. So these, uh, this rapid fire session, um, the talks are five minutes each and they'll be uh, rapid fire. So one after the other. Um, if, if you have any questions, um, type them in the chat and if you can put um, an at symbol and then the speaker's name so we know who to direct the questions to. Um, we'll group all the questions together at the end of the session. Um, so I guess you're ready to go, Marta? Yes, um, I, I am. Great, okay. I'll let I you have... take it away. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, it's really nice to, to be here presenting this. So. I'm gonna go straight into it. Um, just a, a little bit on my background, I'm Portuguese, I'm currently working uh, in Macau, China, and I'm doing my research at the State Key Laboratory of Lunar and Planetary Sciences. I work on microbiology, mostly in mycology with filamentous fungi, so there's an example here, 
And these are fungi that form mycelia, also known as mold. So fungi can be used for all sorts of um, uh, different biotechnological processes. And one of those processes is the, uh, are, are you seeing my screen okay? I, I'm not sure if I have things in front of. Yeah, we can see your presentation and your pointer as well. Okay, good, um, thanks. So fungi can be used for all sorts of biotechnological processes. One of those processes is the production, uh, the synthesis of metallic nanoparticles. And this is a, a very simple process. So metallic nanoparticles are very tiny inorganic particles. And um, these are uh, in the nanometer scale. They can be made of several different types of uh, metals like noble metals, metal, um, uh, magnetic metals, or even semiconductors. So their synthesis can be chemical, physical, or biological. And here I'm showing an example of a biological synthesis, not only because I work with fungi and biological synthesis of metallic nanoparticles, but because this is one of the simplest ways of producing um, metal nanoparticles. So they, they, uh, fungi can be quite easy to manipulate. They allow uh, for the production of um, a large amount of uh, these particles. And basically their synthesis, the simple synthesis is just, you have the, the grown filamentous fungi in agarized media, you cut some plugs, mix, mix it into liquid media. Once you have it grown, then you remove the biomass into sterile water, allow it to incubate a little bit more with fungi, then release all extracellular metabolites. And then you get the supernatant without all the biomass, but with all the extracellular metabolites, you add a chemical precursor, and then once you see a change in color, that means that you have metal nanoparticles that were produced. So this is quite a simple process, but this process is not only made by fungi. So we can assume that all living organisms are able to produce molecules that allow for this formation. So there are descriptions of metal nanoparticles being produced by plants, uh, algae, um, bacteria, viruses, um, and even substances from other complex organisms. So these biogenic uh, metal nanoparticles, they have all sorts of applications. So they're now used um, in like drug delivery, food industry, cosmetic um, industry, in textile industry. They, they are used nowadays for all sorts of things. But one of the things that they are used is um, as biosensors to detect specific microbial species. So we thought, so what if we use their synthesis to search for life? And we know that searching for life is quite complex. So if you consider, for example, Mars, we know that early Mars is, is similar to early Earth, or sorry, early Earth is similar to early Mars, and then studies should be done like on microfossils. But this means that it's quite a complex um, study because it shouldn't be easy to prepare the samples and it would imply complex methods and like complex and expensive equipment. So considering all of this, we should like think of all possible alternatives. And that's when we came across to the definition by Demaras and they um, defined potential biosignatures as features that are consistent with biological process and that when they are encountered, they challenge a research strategy to either inanimate or biological processes. So we thought, okay, so considering this definition, what if we use the synthesis of metal nanoparticles based on the biological synthesis as a way to screen for life? So why don't we use this as potential biosignatures? And this would be quite, thank you. <laughs> but this would be quite easy because it would be a, sim a similar process. We would just get a sample like soil from us mixed in sterile water at a chemical precursor. And then if we saw any change in color, that meant that there would be metal nanoparticles, which meant that there would possibly be um, substances from living organisms in that soil sample. So this would be very simple, fast, cheap, an easy way to screen for life. And that's it. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's plenty more that I could tell you about um, this. We have a paper published on this. I, have, I had a reference on the slides. I don't know if you're going to share them, but please feel free to find me on Twitter or send me an email if you want to know more. That's it, thank you. Thank you, that was a really great synopsis of your research. Very fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, our next rapid fire presenter is Parmita. If you're online, feel free to start sharing your screen. Yes, I'm online. Thanks, Arika. 
Welcome. Um, if you have any questions for Marta, please post them in the chat. Um, and then obviously the same for Pamita as well. And we'll uh, ask them all at the end together. Thank you. Go ahead, Pamita. Okay, can I share my screen? Hello? Yeah, you should be able to share your screen now. Okay. So, are you able to uh, see my uh, screen? Yes, we can. Okay, are you able to see the title page? So we can see the, your PowerPoint, but it's not in presentation mode yet. Okay, okay. So is it fine now? Yep, all good to go. Okay, thank you. Okay, my warm greetings to all of you uh, who are attending this conference. Uh, I'm Paramita Chawle, a PhD student working in Indian School Institute of Technology, ISM Dhanbad, Dharkhand, India. So my topic of research is uh, on ammonia oxidizing bacteria. So I have been working in this department in this field for four long years, for the past four long years. And uh, after researching in this field, I have now come across the fact that this ammo ammonia oxidizing bacteria can be found in exoplanets. So my, this talk, for this session will be carried forward in this field. So how can we uh, get the evidence that this can be found in this exoplanets, ammonia oxidizing bacteria? So uh, starting from the beginning, uh, we should get the intro introduction. What are exoplanets? Exoplanets are planets existing beyond our solar system. Uh, we, should, we are now at the stage we are finding, trying, trying to find life beyond Earth. Is there any life existing beyond Earth? So there are some exoplanets uh, on which NASA and other uh, astrobiological groups are working on. So one of the examples is Kepler-22b. So once upon we have found that uh, whether there is an existence of exoplanet, we are now uh, searching for whether life is possible on the, those planets because our interest in that area only, whether life can exist on exoplanets. So for uh, existence of life, uh, the most important feature is the presence of water. And several gaseous uh, atmospheres has been found in some exoplanets, which are methane, oxygen, and nitrous oxide gas. These have been found in the atmosphere of exoplanets. But uh, uh, scientists and researchers have also got the evidence that methane is not necessarily that it has been biologically produced. It has been found that there is a possibility of finding this gas uh, in abiotic mode also, but these gases were present in such uh, uh, exoplanets. So we got the evidence that these gases are present in those exoplanets and water is also present. We have some various literatures in that. So now my area of research is on ammonia oxidizing bacteria. So how can I get the evidence that these are found in exoplanets? This ammonia oxidizing bacteria has a very uh, unique feature enzyme that is called ammonia oxygenase that is capable of using ammonia as well as methane as its substrate. And it requires oxygen for its functionality. So as we have seen in the previous slide that methane has been found, oxygen and the presence of water has been found. This, this can be, oh, you possibility you can say that this can be found in exoplanets. So how do these methane gets converted into methanol and uh, how can I uh, prove that yes, this can be a possible uh, presence in exoplanets. So if you, this is the AMO enzyme that is ammonia monooxygenase, it can take methane in place of ammonia as well and in, instead of providing met, uh, methanol, it can provide, instead of providing, uh, producing nitrate as the end product, it, it will produce a methanol when, there, when the substrate will be methane. So, um, so uh, I can proceed with the 
further study the uh, how can we initiate this research so, so this is a bacteria ammonia oxidizing bacteria single cell image this is a transmission electron micrographic image of uh, nitrosomonas europa so in this image see, this is a single cell bacteria you can find that these are icm intracytoplasmic membrane they have a thick uh, uh, plasma membrane which are known as intracytoplasmic membrane which carries the enzyme ammonia monooxygenase this enzyme coagulating with each other they form a biofilm structure this is the biofilm structure uh, of uh, nitrosomonas mobilis which is one of the pure culture of ammonia oxidizing bacteria this is a uh, uh, image from one of my publication you can see chawle et al uh, this single cell uh, uh, nitrosomonas species are able to form a colony of cells when they are um, they are able to divide and multiply together when they are in a favorable time you can see the thickness of this colony and uh, this uh, so we we can we can get the evidence that ammonia oxidizing bacteria is present in that atmosphere so how can we detect you can take a single 1 gram of uh, uh, soil rocky soil or whether where, where where there is a rocky surface on exoplanets we can take at least uh, or less than 1 gram of rocky surface and extract the uh, you know extract the total dna dna is what the genetic material inside this cell bacterial cell there lies a, a genetic material which is transferred to another cell during division so this dna is many fold times just coiled around inside the nucleus of this bacterial cell and it covers a whole range of information where you can get the entire functionality of this bacteria DNA is uh, stored in the form of uh, genetic sequence, genome sequence. This you can find A, T, G, C. These these are the nucleotides, and the the, the way they are, they are arranged that are called as the codons. The way they these alphabets, the each alphabet represent a nucleotide. The way they are represents a codon. They have a significant meaning. If we if we replace this thing here and this black portion there, the meaning will reverse and its function will get reversed. So this from if we can extract this information from a single sample of a rock soil which may contain ammonia oxidizing bacteria, we can get this genome data. by various techniques and uh, after this genome this bacterial cell synthesizes proteins from this protein various functions are carried out we can uh, uh, so annotate these proteins we can sequence this protein as well and compare with other microorganisms there there can be a possibility of various other microorganisms and we can compare different sequences Um, Palmita, you have ten seconds left. Hear me? Hello? Can you yeah. hear me? Hi. Yeah, you just have ten seconds left. You're over time. Um, Okay, this is my last PowerPoint present last slide. I'm just showing it. I just want to conclude that from a one gram of a rock sample or a water sample or less than of one gram of sample, we can uh, produce a whole lot of information of the uh, bacterial colony present in a exoplanet system. This are uh, this the field is called metagenomics, or we can say if we get a single organism, we can compare its genomic study with other microorganisms. This is uh, what I want to conclude that from a single uh, sample of less than one gram of sample, we can extract so much of information, and these are the evidence we get. This uh, uh, extremely important enzyme, ammonia monooxygenase, in is capable of taking meat as a substrate so 
I'm sorry to interrupt, but thank you very much, Parmita, um, for your presentation. Uh, all questions are welcome in the chat. We just have to move on because we have lots of rapid fire talks. So thank you. Apologies as well. I was talking and my, my, I was muted as well. So sorry about that. Um, thank you, Parmita, for your talk. Um, any questions for Parmita, please um, just type them in the Zoom chat or take them to Slack as well. Um, so we're going to have to move on just for time. Um, next up, we have Andre. Um, Andre, if you're there, could you please share your screen? Uh, I am here. Oh, you are? Yep. Um, okay. I think that you can see my screen already, yeah? Yes, we can. Uh, so it's okay. just, the, yep, that's it. Great. Yeah. Thank, Take thank it away. You thank much. you. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Uh, the, well, the, the presentation I'm going to, to give now is uh, the result of a collaboration between the State Key Lab of Lunar and Planetary Sciences in Macau, where I work, and with two uh, co-researchers uh, based in Germany at DLR. Um, and so, as I'm sure that you, uh, that you all know, Mars is increasingly a hot topic in astrobiology, but there are still several knowledge gaps that are in our knowledge that are limiting bigger breakthroughs. On one side, we don't know, uh, we're still trying to understand if environmental stressors on Mars are compatible with life. There's still very limited knowledge on facultative anaerobes and on extremophiles from analog sites and whether they'd be able to survive on Mars. Uh, there's clear need to test new model uh, organisms and uh, to know uh, more about potential relevance of polyextremophiles and testing multiple environmental extremes at the same time. And so the Mexim project is trying to address some of these issues by looking into a selected group of microbes and exposing them to a variety of different stress conditions that are equivalent to what we find on Mars. Uh, the idea is to study how these environmental stress conditions will affect survival rates. Uh, this will be followed by a later stage uh, of experiments uh, performed at the International Space Station. And this will take place within the next three to four years. So it's already been approved. Um, and so the main goal of MEXEM is to find, to highlight, to uncover new model organisms for astrobiology. And so this is what I want to tell you all about today. Um, we have some really interesting preliminary results from one of the microbes that has been selected for these experiments. The microbe is Salini Sferashabanensis. It was uh, isolated from deep sea brines of the Red Sea. So this is a very interesting uh, type of environment, very interesting terrestrial analog site. It combines multiple extreme conditions, high salinity, uh, high pressure conditions, anoxic uh, environment, hydrothermal input. Um, and so this micro was isolated from a very interesting uh, site. Uh, in addition to this, we, studies that we've done in the lab have shown that it has very, uh, very relevant versatility. It's quite versatile and it seems to be quite resilient. So it made for an interesting candidate for these studies. From a taxonomical perspective, it represents a new species, but it's actually the first representative of a new order within the gamma proteobacteria. So that was an added benefit there. Uh, as results of uh, preliminary experiments that we've done, uh, namely on exposure to tolerance to desiccation and tolerance to UV, uh, we've been able to show, to uncover that there's a high tolerance to an oxic desiccation, um, which is something that is, that is really interesting and seems to be doing better than the majority of other reference vegetative, vegetative cells. So it's worthwhile mentioning that Salinisfera does not produce spores. So the, the extra resilience that it has is particularly interesting. Um, we've also done some exposure experiments to Martian atmosphere, which lowered the survival rate by about one order of magnitude. But we were able to partially control this um, reduced survival rate by adding sugars that would have some sort of protective, protective uh, effect on the cells, and also by using Martian-like soils. Regarding UV radiation, we were also able to show some moderate tolerance that fitted well with the range of other standard and halophilic model microorganisms. So we're, we're quite happy with these results. Um, as a final set of experiments, this was a more recent thing. We sent Salinisfera up for a ride on a balloon. This was part of the uh, of a uh, um, special program by NASA. So it was part of collaboration with NASA. And so results from the stratospheric balloon experiments also, also shown that uh, the cells of Salinisfera are quite sturdy. They, they're able to survive 
Uh, so we were able to detect surviving cells after five months of desiccation. Four this included, yes, this included a seven hour balloon flight, a 30 kilometers height and exposure to UV radiation. And we were able to confirm these results using two different uh, sets of, uh, of controls using classical plating and Alamar blue assays. So as an overview on future research, we propose that Salinisferus charbonensis is, should be used as a new model organism for astrobiology. These are just the results of the preliminary studies. So Salinisferus charbonensis comes from a relevant um, environment and it has very relevant characteristics. Um, the preliminary results, as I mentioned, are quite promising and future experiments will focus on combining multiple extremes and cross comparison with other species. And of course, the next phase with exposure experiments aboard the International Space Station. I just wanted to leave as a final slide that we're looking for new students and faculty. Feel free to send me an email or a message on Twitter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andre. And also that was perfectly timed to just under five minutes. So well done on that too. Um, any questions for Andre, please uh, type them in the chat on the side. Um, and we'll now move on to the next speaker, Mian Bezad uh, Nadim Qureshi, Qureshi. Apologies for the pronunciation. If you're there, uh, you're welcome to share your screen now. Hi, Erika. Can you hear Hi. me? Yes, we can. Okay, that's great. Um, yeah, so can I share my screen? Yep, go ahead. Okay. Um, hello everyone. I'm Behzad from Pakistan and I'm a student of biotechnology at Kohat University of Science and Technology. My research Sorry, topic is- to interrupt pro Before you get started, we can't see the actual um, presentation. We can see the, the slides, but not the presentation view. Um, can you see it now? now? Yeah, okay. great, go ahead. Okay, okay thank you. So, hello everyone, I'm Behzad from Pakistan and I'm a student of biotechnology at Kohat University of Science and Technology. My research topic is proliferation and survival analysis of Rhizosphere soil bacteria in Mars soil simulants MGS1 and KB Mars1 under several simulated Mars conditions. So, I'll quickly give you an overview of my research but cannot share all the details because of time constraint. So, growth in Mars soil simulant. So this is a, a general overview of my methodology and workflow. So my research is still going on. So I'll share uh, the results I got so far. First is soil characterization. So we use a scanning electron microscopy with energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy uh, to identify the elemental composition. And uh, on the left, you can see the actual graph from uh, SAM ADS. Uh, and on the right, uh, you can see the elemental composition. So uh, I'll be comparing uh, the elemental composition of our soil with, uh, with Mars soil and already existing uh, simulants available. So this is an actual image of our soil and we are calling it KP Mars 1. Uh, so uh, this is a, a comparison. I, I'll go through it quickly. Um, uh, so you can see the elements and compounds found in uh, Martian soil, uh, the readings from Viking 2 Lander, Curiosity, and, uh, and uh, the, 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 the middle portion is KP Mars 1, uh, which is uh, uh, our soil. And on the right, you can see uh, three commercially available Mars soil simulants and their uh, elemental composition. So uh, we, uh, the Seleka uh, we found in our soil is 39.19% and you can see that there is not a lot of deviation from actual Mars soil and from subsimilants. Then we have titanium 0.9%. Then we have alumina 14.89, uh, chromium was not detected. That's time, uh, if you could start uh, wrapping it up, that would be great, thanks. Okay. So uh, th these are some elements and uh, you can take a screenshot and uh, compare them. Uh, so yeah. Uh, so these are some pre pre preliminary resu results from our soil uh, bacteria survival in minus 80 degrees centigrade for three days. 
So uh, we took 0 0.5 ml of rhizosphere uh, inoculum and uh, broth, and we inoculated in it in marsh soil simulant. And uh, so from 0 0.5 ml, we got 64 uh, CFU. From 1 ml, we got to 10 CFU. From 2 ml, we got 300 plus CFU. And then uh, there was a, um, a plate with uh, only cells plus marsh soil simulant, and we got 300 plus uh, cells, uh, C CFU, sorry. So these were some really exciting results for us uh, to continue the work. Uh, these are some outcomes, application in astrobiology, application in Mars colonization, how plants can be assisted to grow on Mars, etc. Uh, these are some next steps. We're going to try uh, growth in anaerobic condition, in UVC radiation, low soil moisture content, and then a combined several Martian co conditions. And at the end, we are going to try uh, 16S RNA sequencing. And these are my acknowledgements. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so the next person is Scarlett Lee Williams. Um, Scarlett, I'd like to invite you to share your screen now. Um, and this is continuing on a similar theme with uh, growing things in space, in this case, legumes. So, We should be able to share it now. Give it a go. Any questions for Bezad, please put them in the chat to the side. Thank you. Okay, can you see it? All good, go ahead. Okay, great. I'm just gonna whip through this super quick. Um, any questions and anything, that's my email address. Um, I'll be f feel free to ask any questions. Okay. Um, so yeah, just really quickly and briefly about um, the team and what we do. We're currently an undergraduate student-led research project group uh, based at the University of New South Wales. Um, we have some affiliations with ArcUSW, Burns Lab and the ACA. Um, and this is the current project that we are working on. Um, it's called HUMS2, mainly because we're working with some rhizobium. Um, that are for chickpea plants and we're looking at the symbiotic relationship between the two. So the actual aim of the experiment is to look at the capability of bacterial nitrogen fixation in microgravity and lunar gravity conditions and the effects on symbiotic relationships and the growth of these legume plants. We're hoping to see possible morphological changes in root nodules in microgravity as well as um, any changes in nitrogen fixation capabilities as well as the actual changes in symbiotic relationships. Um, and the reason that we're looking at legumes is because they have a very important role in agriculture, in feeding livestock, as well as soil health, as we heard previously. Um, and they will be needed for uh, future colonizations, whether it's Mars, the moon, um, as well as just basic understanding of how these relationships will work. Um, so just a quick brief uh, background on legumes themselves. Um, some common examples of these kind of plants are beans, peas, chickpeas, lentils, peanuts, and most of them have a symbiotic relationship with nitrogen fixing bacteria such as rhizobium. Um, and they basically grow these bacteria in these structures um, in the actual roots of the plant called root nodules, as you can see in this diagram here. Their role is to basically fix atmospheric nitrogen into compounds that the plant can use. Um, and these are very important for the plant because um, it basically is needed to make chlorophylls, amino acids, ATP, nucleic acids, and more. Um, so in this diagram, you can see this is kind of how they work. The little red blobs are where the bacteria live. They're the actual root nodules. Inside those, you have a, a symbiosome, and then inside those, you have your bacteroids. Um, with the help of this enzyme, nitrogenase, you can see that you can convert atmospheric uh, not, uh, nitrogen into ammonia, um, which the plant needs. And in return, in the symbiotic relationship, you get um, the plant itself providing a carbon source and sugars to the bacteria. Um, you can see down here in these photos, which are from the Pulsford Lab at the University of Sydney, who we collaborate with, um, these little root nodules. Um, and that's what's called a positive nodulation. Um, so the actual experiment itself. Um, so here you can see the chamber that we're actually using. It's actually um, a chamber that was made by the International uh, Space University and it did the Hydra One missions in 2018, where they grew seeds on the International Space Station. So this is uh, what the actual CubeSat looks like itself. Um, and this is like a schematic that you can see the, what the inside will look like. So what we're hoping to do is run our experiment in the chamber gap here. Um, 
Um, so this will be what our biological payload is. We're hoping to put 10-day-old um, plants because they'll be the correct height inside the gap that you can see here. Um, we'll have test tubes. We're going to build a rack itself, um, as you can see here, and they'll just slot in. Um, and the way that we're going to actually analyze the biological payload itself um, is to look at multiple things. The first one would be the nodulation color because root nodules have this nice pink color here. Um, and we'll also look at the nodule health, their size and the count that they have compared to ground tests that we'll be running at the exact same time. We'll be taking daily photos as well inside the capsule. So they'll be sent down every day because um, the CubeSat itself um, will be sending back data. Um, and we'll also be looking at um, hydrogen production because um, we're doing um, hydrogen assays where we'll actually be putting in inert gases um, such as argon um, as the nitrogenase as mentioned earlier which is the enzyme that works we'll be catalyzing this um, through the nitrogen fixation process and then we'll do a nitrogenase assay as well um, when the nitrogenase assay will show sort of a reduction in different gases such as acetylene to ethylene um, and we'll also be looking at isotopes um, but we still need to do our preliminary ground experiments to be able to study that more and I think I've sped through that really quickly um, but that's it <laughs> so yeah we're currently looking for sponsors as well for this mission okay Thank you. That was a very um, concise talk. So well done. Um, and our last, uh, our last speaker for this rapid fire session is Caitlin MacArthur. Um, Caitlin, I'd like to invite you to share your screen now. Hi, I'm here. How are you going? I'm good. Thank you. So any questions as before, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and Caitlin, if you're right, you can take it away. Yeah, just is the, um, the screen sharing disabled? Uh, it shouldn't be. Just try again. Yeah, try again now. Oh, yeah, got it. Thank you. Cool. Great. Okay, can everyone see that? Sure can. Yeah, so hi, I'm Caitlin MacArthur. I'm from Aotearoa, New Zealand. And I'm going to be talking about my research group, what we've been looking at with how ionizing radiation affects astronaut health in long-term space missions. So there are a few of us from all around the world working on this project. So we have Maria, who is a microbiologist from Colombia, Roberto, who studies medicine in Italy, and then our advisor is Dr. Dimitra Atri, who is an astrophysicist from Abu Dhabi. And then I study biomedical science in Wellington, New Zealand. Um, and I'm also here to represent the New Zealand Astrobiology Network, who are an organization here in New Zealand who aim to just promote the study of astrobiology, astrobiology to teachers and students. Because um, New Zealand is a really biologically and geologically diverse country. So astrobiology has just got so much potential here. Okay, so why is it important to look at how ionizing radiation affects the human body? So back in 1972 in August, there were some of the largest solar storms that we have on historical record. Um, and the dates that these occurred were the same dates that had been considered for the launch of um, Apollo 16 or 17. But luckily that didn't happen because if it had the Apollo astronauts in flight would have been exposed to around 0.5 gray of radiation which I'll get to how much damage that could have done. Um, and so our research is looking at how that sort of radiation dose could affect the human body and what the mitigation strategies would be, looking at both dietary and technological strategies of pre um, preventing harm to astronauts, because this is not just a risk for Apollo, but also just in the International Space Station and on travel to Mars, solar storms are kind of unpredictable. And then just the overall radiation dose that you are experiencing in interplanetary space and on Mars is considerably higher than on Earth. So we need to know what sort of damage to prepare for. So my research has been focusing on the impact of radiation on physiological systems. So I've looked at a, a really wide range, but I've just summed up here some of the really interesting and important ones. So we've got acute radiation syndrome and this primarily at spaceflight relevant radiation doses affects the bone marrow. So you end up with 
an inability to form blood cells. So your red and white blood cells, which can lead to symptoms of anemia and uh, reduced immune system function. Um, fatigue is something that's seen a lot in radiotherapy patients as a side effect of um, receiving radiotherapy for a, a brain tumor. And so fatigue is a big concern of a side effect of radiation exposure in astronauts because astronauts need to be alert when they're in space. And the, bile, the skeletal system is another one that's really susceptible to radiation damage and bone loss has been seen to persist even just in um, astronauts in the International Space Station. So returning to Earth, it can persist from nine weeks to four months. Um, I said before about how the immune system can be impaired and that's due to the fact that radiation can lead to a decline in the numbers and also the, the functionality of immune cells following radiation exposure. Cardiovascular disease is the world's leading cause of death, but it has been seen um, very prominently in historical radiation disasters, so survivors of Chernobyl and also the um, atomic bombings of both Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, survivors of both of those events have been shown to have a higher risk of developing radiation-induced cardiovascular disease. And then cancer risk due to the radiation exposure is another um, big side effect of being in space. And it's been seen in ISS astronauts that their um, risk of developing cancer really increases. This risk is higher for women due to the number of female specific cancers. So like breast cancer and uterine and ovarian. So that's the summary of my research. And then Maria, who is from Colombia, has been looking at the formation of cataracts, which is another big side effect of radiation exposure. Um, and a lot of astronauts actually fail their training due to um, eyesight problems. And, um, so then she's also been looking at the GI tract and how radiation exposure affects the GI microbiome, so the um, bacteria and the microorganisms that live there to take up space and protect you from harmful organisms. And this microbiome has been seen to drop considerably following radiation exposure. And then Roberto has been looking at the effects of ionizing radiation on DNA damage, um, specifically through the production of reactive oxygen species and looking at what sort of damage that induces in DNA, the mutations it induces, and looking at dietary strategies, so specifically antioxidants of how we could use antioxidants to counteract this effect of um, reactive oxygen species production in astronauts to try and give them some protection. And that is the summary of my research. I hope you enjoyed. Um, we are publishing a manuscript which will summarize this research if you'd like to learn more about it. So keep up to date with it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Caitlin. Also keeping to time there, so great work. Um, so I'd like to invite um, all of those rapid fire speakers um, to show your video and unmute yourself if you're happy to do that. Um, we'll open it up just for a couple of minutes um, of discussion and or questions. So we had quite a few questions uh, for Marta and Andre, and I think they were um, answered straight away in the chat. Um, we've got a question here from Marta to Scarlett. Um, any similar studies done with mycorrhizal fungi? Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. <laughs> I'm sure there are. I'm, I'm, I'm not particularly, I can't say with any confidence, um, but I've looked into fungi in particular. I mainly just look into bacteria. Um, but it's definitely an interesting area because they're just as important for the health of soils. Well, so. well they're both vegan, so I, I assume that yeah. it would be easy to like do similar parallel research. But yeah. yeah. No, exactly. Yeah. Good good point. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, and a question from Christina for Caitlin. Have you considered high fiber diet for reducing intestinal inflammation? Um, we haven't looked specifically at fiber, but we've looked at probiotics and seen that that can have a really good effect in reducing the impact on the microbiome. So I guess fiber would be another really interesting dietary requirement to look at because that would also um, prevent some of that harm for sure. Cool. And um, a comment here from Graham. If there are any early career students out there tuning in to this uh, session, keep an eye out for the next year's internships at the Blue Marble um, Space Institute. They'll be announced in February. And I think we had one more question for Scarlett from Diego. 
do you uh, have you evaluated the capability of nodulation under microgravity conditions? No, so that's kind of what we're hoping to do um, within the next couple of years. I'm um, just trying to get that off the ground, really, because that's that's the conditions we want on the International Space Station. Great. All right. Well, if there aren't any other questions, we might move on uh, to our invited speaker. Um, thank you very much, everyone, uh, for your rapid fire presentations. Um, and we look forward to continuing the discussion in the Slack, cha Slack channel. Um, I'd li now like to welcome Dr. Sarah Jane Moore, who's our invited speaker for this session. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> um, I will hand it over to you because I know you've got a few exciting things planned for us. So take it away. Thank you. I would like to deeply thank the organisers for this unique opportunity to share from my home in Lutuita. And of course, you can't control Mother Nature. <laughs> so my big reveal is Tim Tamili Mananya and that's uh, otherwise known as River Derwent. But she lies in Puna in cloud. But nonetheless, I'm out in the Rina Dina in Lutruita, Tasmania. And I would like to sing a welcome from my country, from my heart and from the great lands and sea country of Luchuita, Tasmania, from the deep heart of the Muwanina people, who are the ancestral custodians of this lands, rivers, sea countries. And without any further ado, I'd like to sing you onto my country. He kunani he mo ile halo akani loli me kauna ragi arapa he kunani una. So I've just sung from the mountain to the sea and I'd like to come into my studio and welcome you to my artistic practice. I'd also like to welcome all First Nations people from Oceania and beyond, from the Marinina, Mariana Islands to Aotearoa, New Zealand, from Lichuita, Tasmania, to the great Gadigal mob on which this online presentation is hosted and from which I emerge from a wonderful association, collaboration and learning uh, with my colleagues. So I'm deeply honoured and thrilled to be able to be an invited speaker to speak from the heart, to sing from the country, and to share our most incredible friendship across the miles, from the stars, from the desert, from the ancestral places. I often think that I've got my ancestors at my shoulder. I often think that I have my scientists at my back and I'd like to reveal the beautiful painting that has been created with a collaboration between a number of us that will speak today. The moon is a blood moon. It's not the blood of my ancestors. It's the deep connection 
and community that I have with you and all those who broker wonderful reconciliation dialogues with my colleagues and my new friends. So this moon is a new moon. It's a new time and a new space. It's built from the ochre that I harvest from Tim Tamili Mananya that is now in cloud in Puna. I walk to the river, I whirled with the river and I harvest from her to be able to communicate to you about the wonderful partnerships that have grown this work and conversations. Beneath the image and deeply embedded within the work is and continues to have a tree. It's a tree of knowledge. It's a tree of friendship. It's remembering river gum. It's remembering sand and river. It's remembering Lauren in Chicago who will speak with us about her interface. Uh, with my work and her enduring friendship with Brendan. And this work has a beautiful hand and it's my hand of friendship. And my hand has five fingers. Uh, and our numbering system has few and many. But five is very important and five is a very, very important and respected symbol in and of my culture. And if you turn your hand around, you can blow the ochre on your hand and you can mark your cave forever. And we're hoping <laughs> that there won't be any more sacred sites being lost to the futures. We're hoping that we can all hold them safe and dear and respectfully. And so the five colleagues who worked with me told me stories of themselves, their, fi their field work, that we shared heart and story and song. And although it was only last week, I feel that it was a very wonderful opportunity for me to develop a creative artwork, uh, a visual art work, a visual art practice based on the ideas shared in a supersonic session, a supersonic digital session. And I've been very, very proud to frame the supersonic session, the ancestral moon story of our heart song. Uh, in Tasmanian oak. So from Luchawita, Tasmania, we have the Tasmanian oak and I'll turn my phone off because um, my children shouldn't be able to contact me now. But who should be able to contact us now is Brendan Burns. And I would like to call on Brendan to speak and I would like Brendan to map his interface with my work, uh, to acknowledge the country that he's on and um, to speak about his involvement in the generation of this image. And he will be number one, Pama. <laughs> number two <laughs> will be Martin, if possible. Pama Paya Lua. Lua will be Luke Star of the Star Man, Luke Stella, our Stella presenter. And the two others will follow and then we'll have a special journey uh, with Lauren who's beaming in from Chicago. So how lucky we are to be so connected and so far apart. 
And without any further ado, I would like to welcome Brendan Burns into the studio with Dr. Sarah Jane Moore. Hello, Brendan. Hello, Sarah. That was a fantastic song and that is a beautiful painting. It's really, really good. Um, and I'm, I, was, I was just really, really um, touched to be involved on this. I'm coming from um, Gadigal country in, in the Sydney area um, and want to acknowledge the elders past and presence on which the land, which sovereignty has never been ceded. Um, and it's just been beautiful to be involved with this painting. I can't even recall exactly everything that I said when we were doing this digital session. I knew, I remember a lot of it was based on my um, journey with our family is important to me, um, but also just understanding life in general, I think, and a journey of, of equity and inclusivity in everything we do in life. That is, I guess, where I'm coming from and going to, I hope. That's great. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Pama, where's my lua? Where's my number two? Where's the number two on my hand? Martin, it's over to you. Hi there, Sarah Jane. Thank you so much. It's exciting to be part of this. And um, yeah, it's wonderful to have um, you contribute to our meeting. I think it's important for all to recognize that um, there's much more to science than just being a scientist. It's about our whole personality, I think. And, you know, you really get something out of um, the undertaking that you do if you give everything that you have to it. And of course, we're all creative beings. We're all uh, thinking beings. We're all emotional beings. And um, yeah, I think it's a lovely opportunity to allow parts of those aspects of our personality out into the uh, open forum and not just be behind our professional face all the time. So we're very fortunate to have you to allow that to, uh, to come on. I think from what I remember also, and uh, what was interesting when we talked about, you know, you asked us to give the five words. So again, that sort of link to the, to the hand, five fingers, five points, five emotions, five thoughts was, um, for me was really connecting to our planet and to nature. Uh, and it's funny when you put it in words, how powerful that feeling is. It's something that I study and uh, I look at, but I have a very deep emotional connection to the area that I study and to this journey that we're all on about really understanding, understanding the very deep origins of, uh, of life in this very special place. So it's wonderful to be able to talk about that and express that and share that. I think a big component of what we do is about sharing. And I think your presence here allows us to share in a different way. So thank you very much for that. What a beautiful and poetic and quite surprising understanding for me about working with you, Martin, is the amount of love that your colleagues and students and collaborators hold for you. And so a little bit later, I'm going to share my love song. <laughs> it's a love song for you. It's a love song for your colleagues and it's a love song for the earth. Fantastic. Oh, um, Pama, Paya, Lua, Eddie, Luke. Yeah. Hey, um, I hope you all can hear me. Am I coming through? Yeah. yeah amazing. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I've um, known SJ for a while now and was really excited about this collaboration. Um, when we had our beautiful sort of meeting and sharing of um, five things that were of real value to us in this field and in our scientific endeavors, um, it's the same thing that Martin touched on just then and in his talk previously as well about how being out in the field really brings people together, you know, and how um, when I first, I was an undergrad, Martin needed someone to help drive people around in the field because they needed more drivers for these um, beaten up four wheel drives that I'd have to get up to all the fossil sites. So he invited me out there to um, drive around in these really beaten up tracks. And being out in the bush and being in nature, something I really was passionate about, but I never saw um, a place in science for that, you know, science to me was always in a lab, very sterile, very rigid. And I think being able to see amazing scientists like Martin and Tara and all these people out there that were just having fun and loving the 
you know, the bush and we'll wake up and watch sunrises and sunsets and sort of the, the nature and the, the tracking of the sun really sort of directed our day, you know, which was really amazing. I loved that um, combination of experiences. And I guess the moon came in because I'd never slept out in a swag before. And one of my first nights out there was this incredible um, full moon. And because it was so dusty, it was, it was really it was, um, red, you know, this blood red um, moon as it rose. And it woke me up and I was, I had no idea what it was, you know, I'd never seen a moon that big, never seen a moon that bright because there's no pollution out there at all. It's just this red dust and this amazing moon. So, um, yeah, that really was a very special um, time in my life. And that's really, you know, projected me from my entire research now, you know, and as I was saying before, I've been um, up in Ladakh doing some hot spring work up there for a few people that have been in um, this talk today. And I've been to New Zealand and a lot of my research now brings me out into the field, out into nature. And I'm just so, um, yeah, really joyous about that and what astrobiology brings to me. So, yeah, thanks for um, being part of this, SJ. <laughs> and what country are you calling in from? Um, so I'm in Gadigal land as well. So up at UNSW in um, a very sterile office. But um, you can get a glimmer outside and it's, it's a bit of rain, it's a bit of wind, some excitement happening outside. So, yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. So maybe the rain's um, building up my rain uh, and now we've got a little bit of sunshine yeah <laughs> outside the she shed so uh that's a beautiful and poetic uh, expression of love um for country love for land love for curiosity and we have a lot in common luke because we are curious creative collaborators got the triple c's <laughs> so, uh, very, very happy that we've met and we'll continue to work together. And I would like Anna to share if she's able, because I have Hello. I have Taya, I have Lua, and I have Willia. So you're my four in my five hands that have reached across cultures across islands, across creativities, and across interdisciplinary thinking and working and reached out to me uh, to bring an artist in and amongst you mob. So I'd really like you to share what you bring and what you have and, um, and I'd like you to reflect on the process of the work that we did together. And can you describe a little bit of how it was for you to be my fourth finger? Um, I'd be delighted to, thanks Sarah Jane. So I'm joining you from the land of the Wongal clan um, of the Darug tribe um, over in Strathfield in Sydney. And, um, I guess for me, I, uh, it was a, it's amazing working with these um, geologists because they have a very strong connection to country. And, you know, I, I was born in Australia and grew up here, but um, I, I've always been a city person and my research, my PhD in physics. So for physics, it's very much like abstract. It's more in our minds with numbers and things like that. But um, coming back to Australia and working with these people at the Australian Centre for Astrobiology is really brought that sense of wonder back to me. Like how could we be in Australia and not think about the amazing history of the First Nations people and also, um, yeah, just the amazing outback and country. So, um, so I'm really honored to be part of this. And when you asked us to think of five words, it was really getting away from the numbers and the technical side and thinking about emotionally how I'm connected to my work and what inspires me to keep doing science. And so um, I guess the word that stood out the most to us was that sense of wonder. And um, it's what sort of propels me forwards. Um, and it's what makes me so excited to be part of this sort of interdisciplinary community and also to you know, extend beyond the sciences and engineering and have you involved. Um, it's just always being curious. Um, we, we live in a wonderful world and we have to keep engaging with it and seeing new parts of it. Um, so. Yeah, thank you so much for, for doing this for us and, and connecting us. And uh, you see, you get a greater reveal of the studio as we work through this process 
this process of storing, of yarning, of sharing, of reflecting. And so the moon, Luke's blood moon, my ochre moon, has now been joined um, in the middle by the guitar, by the music, and later you might even hear that special word wonder, which is what you brought to me. And so that was lovely that you added wonder because I, as an artist, spend a lot of time wondering. I have a PhD in reconciliation through music and art, and I've helped people in Aboriginal communities wonder how reconciliation can happen. And it was great for you to remind me of the special joy of the wonder. So I placed that special word into the song that I'll sing for you. And uh, now you have the image of my family who join us um, because one of the reasons I work in this space is to create a hope-filled um, an energetic space for art and science, uh, a space of hope, and Luke expressed that hope as well, and that great joy. And Brendan has a great hope for social justice, and I've been really humbled and honoured to meet scientists that have great heart, have great hope, and also are able to evidence that with high caliber research and I and I'm very very honored to be part of your cohort port now so um, I've joined you with my family here I've collected um, helicranky diamonds we call them the magic of diamonds really they're beach combing um, uh, crystals um, but for us as as people who have a great respect old storytellers magic and wonderings I've embedded those killer cranky diamonds in the heart of my life of my third born <laughs> and also I've ground the oyster shells deep within the ancestral heart of me and I'm always by the river always by the water and that culture, country, land and wondering sustains and nourishes me for myself but also for my family and for the next generation to come and I see great evidence of scientists having the same wish and the same heart if not the same story, if not the same song but we have a lot of affinity and association and I'm I'm really thrilled by that discovery for me. And I have one more sharer who's going to introduce herself now. Thank you. Pama, Paya, Lua, Wulia, Mara, Mara. The fifth element. And then we're going to have my Chicago magic. Lucky me. Thank Hi, you. Sarah Jean. Thank you so much. Um, your artwork is beautiful and it really brings together, I think, you know, that the five things we, we all kind of had, they were different, but there were quite a lot of similar themes with our, our five things. Um, so I'm joining you from the Blue Mountains, west of Sydney in Australia, and I'm on Darug and Gundungurra country. And, <laughs> and I think probably one of the things um, that resonates most in a meeting like this and also astrobiology um, more broadly is the sense of interconnectedness that we have both i mean we're all we're all calling in today from you know around the world which is incredible despite the time zones and everything um, we all come from a different origin different background um, different experiences but we we come and meet here today um, and then also from, I guess, the perspective of science and the research, we all bring completely different, you know, different things that together to, to form this community that's astrobiology. Um, we all have completely different expertise and only when it's joined together do we really kind of grow and learn from each other. So, yeah, I guess that sense of interconnectedness um, was a big one for me. And I think, yeah, you... <laughs> 
Um, you've really put in all the other aspects as well, um, curiosity, nature, wonder, um, you know, inclusivity. It's really all tied in there. So thank you very much, Sarah Jane. Awesome, thank you. What a great team. Pama, Paya, Lua, Wulia, Mara. Magic. <laughs> Sometimes we have magic fingers. I often um, teach young children stories and um, I often talk about the magic of our hands. And what I've noticed about a lot of scientists that I've met in the last two years since my association with UNSW, first as a project officer and uh, most recently as an artist in residence. Uh, now I'm an adjunct associate lecturer in bees. But what I do notice about the scientists that I've become close to is their energy through their hands. So field work, collecting, fossicking, finding. And I found that really a very creative and interconnected process. And if you think of our oceanic brothers and sisters uh, and the connections that we have across many, many lands and many, many countries, many First Nations countries, seas, rivers, when we think about the globe, I really think about a deep sense of connection through my hands, through what I make, because I'm ostensibly a visual artist. I work in digital realms and theatre and songwriting and sound. I've had a long career, a 30-year trajectory all the way to the stars. And the hands and the globe and the connections and the interconnections are something that I'm very, very interested in. Luke and I are weaving uh, together, apart, together, apart. And that's been a really interesting part of my association at UNSW. But I would like to call on my superstar, my surprise visitor, Lauren. Hey, um, so my name is Lauren and I'm calling in from, actually I just got back to Champaign, so I'm at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign right now. Um, and I had the pleasure to meet Dr. Sarah Jane Moore um, um, about a year ago actually. And my first week in Australia, um, she allowed me to come and participate in her um, Abor Aboriginal art piece with the oysters. And it was so amazing, it was interactive. You know, you had, it was on uh, the UNSW campus and you had um, all these students walking by, and, um, you know, Sarah would call out at them to come and put an oyster on. And, you know, the art piece, it just came together the way it should have and the way, you know, all the energy and um, emotion that was poured into it just came and it just fell together. Um, and it was a really important piece and it was, it was amazing to be a part of it because my first week in Australia, I learned about um, the importance of this piece and um, how, you know, 85% of our reefs worldwide are lost and that means that the Abor Aboriginal people are, you know, losing their oyster heritage. And um, that means a lot. And so um, as, you know, citizens of the globe, you know, these, these things, they belong to us and we need to protect them. And I really learned that um, through being a part of that piece. And um, art and science, you know, it is so important to realize how interconnected everything is. Um, you know, all the different fields of science, they're so connected. And it's so important to understand um, that interdisciplinary research and even just crafts, they come together to make us a whole. And so um, one thing my uh, professor, my mentor here um, in Champaign, Dr. Bruce Falk, he wrote a book called The Art of Yellowstone Science. And you can actually find it um, on NASA's website if you look up 
The Art of Yellowstone Science, NASA. And you can uh, download the whole book. And the first page of the book, um, how he starts the book is, art and science both originate from the same human desire to understand the world within and around us. Where did we come from? How did we get here? Why are we here? Where are we going? To seek answers, science requires inspiration from art, just as art earns for understanding from science. This dynamic drives imagination and motivates curiosity. And so I just, I love that that's just how the book starts and it explains um, all the Yellowstone science and um, how that can be connected to space exploration and understanding the world around us. And I'm just so appreciative to be a part of this and hear your stories and your research and your journeys out in the field and in the lab. Um, and I'm just so grateful. Thank you, Dr. Sarah Jane Moore for allowing me to uh, be a part of this as well. <laughs> now imagine the person that introduced us. Now, Brendan, did you have a hand in our introduction? I want you to just um, talk us through how you delivered Lauren to the reef building and to her understanding of the importance of the reef in uh, nurturing, nourishing, and helping us to understand our interconnectivity. Sure, I'll try and bring it back. Hey, go, Lauren. Um, so this, this was just by chance, if you like. So Lauren came for a short stint with Martin and myself um, from Chicago as part of her degree. And the time was perfect because it was just when you were doing your installation. And also another link which you will remember is a colleague of mine and, and Martin's and also Lauren, Peter Bisher in Connecticut. He was just over in Shark Bay and he just collected some samples for me, which all, and he also grabbed some of these coquina shells um, from Shark Bay, which you then included in the oyster and in some of your artwork. And that, that, was, that was beautiful for me, connecting the West Coast with the East Coast um, of Australia in your artwork. And so, yeah, so it was just, I guess, by chance that it was good timing for Lauren to be here she was here for science, obviously, um, and also to experience life in a new country and everything like that. But to be able to experience the view from an Indigenous Australian from art and science, I think was really rewarding for us. So I think it was just, it was chance, but I think it worked out really well. And I'd like to talk to chance and happenstance. Uh, in, uh, in the Dada, which is a movement, an art movement that, um, most scientists may not be aware of the importance of chance happenstance a little bit of chaos mm -hmm. uh, is actually part of the message of the making and so i believe that brendan meeting you and for you to be involved in the project um, that needed scientists to step up and in to help me. Um, 3,000 shells uh, were counted by Benham, very maths oriented brain. So Benham counted those 3,000 oyster shells in three languages. One of them was Persian. I've never heard <laughs> Persian, it's absolutely beautiful and poetic and incredible. I wasn't capable of counting my shells. I could collect them and have them delivered to me and find out of their connection. But I really needed scientists to step up and help me because many, many hands were needed to make 3000 Sydney rock oysters into the reef that I was imagining. So 3000 oyster shells delivered to a quadrangle uh, a nice grass quadrangle took a lot of wrangling for me and took a lot of unexpected turns when I needed to brief security and to stand on the quad and state my dream and state that no one would hurt themselves with these and they couldn't be trajectories for any kind of danger because for me, they're beautiful, they're poetic. They're sea country, they're symbols of my culture, they're living stories, they're living entities. How could anyone disrespect those? 
And it was the truth. We built the wreath and Lauren came every day and she brought up the sleeves and I had hand dyed lab coats because I didn't like the white. No, no, I wanted something a little bit more earthy. Luke came and we built a beautiful reef. We had children come from in buses with local um, with local folk. We had students, we had scientists, we had folk that are now in their beautiful homes. And it was deeply significant for me for uh, to be gifted the Kikina shells. Because for me, who needs connection and who thrives on the collective and the anti-individual for Brendan to broke up for another human to bring a really special special shell the Kikina shell which holds holds story and reef and history it was greater than I imagined and that made it really magical for me and I've continued um, to talk across the miles with Peter and I said that I was talking about him today so I'm hoping his ears will be burning because that's something we say in Tasmania that your ears burn if people talk you up and it's something more and it's something deeper because if we talk you up you exist if we make you visible you are heard and if we celebrate the very being of your culture then that is something really wonderful and special. And that's one of my key messages for you. So I'm going to sing the song now, and then there'll be a little bit of time for questions or comments or statements, or there could be time for silence. And, and that's okay too, because sometimes after singing about culture, and making work that's really important there is time for si silence in science and uh, Luke taught me that because he told me once that he laid down on the red desert sand and looked up and he saw the stars This is my love song to Martin. It's called She Worlds, but it's also called He Worlds. It's also called They World. It's an inclusive song for Brendan, who deeply values social justice. It's a song across the miles, Lauren, because I'd love you to come and visit me in Nutriwita, Tasmania going to be a while. It's a song of wonder for Erica <laughs> and it has a deep Dharawal Wiradjuri heart. Yeah. 
questions this world in spirit directions reflection you will I'm working September at springtime on furs. I'm working September. I'm thinking we will. I'm spinning this love song, no ending in service we toil. Compassion, sights crashing, they're smashing my world. I'm broken, she's smoking, you're just a sun first. Through gifts and through listening in science. We will. Lauren, across the miles, can you sing with me? In science, in silence, in Chicago, in Champagne, she will. Okay. <laughs> in silence, in Chicago, she will. Brenda. <laughs> In silence, in silence, Brendan singing, he wills. Erica, in silence, in silence, on Erica's mountain, she wills. Luke, in silence, in silence, he's giving me the moon. <laughs> The worlds <laughs> in science, his he worlds, and in my business, when we like something, we do this, and if we really like <laughs> this, <laughs> it's beautiful, Sarah. When we give a round of applause, we do this. One hand clap. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sarah. That was fantastic. Thank you so Sarah. much, Sarah Jane. That was really great. Beautiful. So everyone um, joining in on this call, um, Sarah Jane put that song together, especially for our meeting, um, based on the discussions she had with the five or six of us um, about a week ago. Um, so that was incredible, Sarah, Sarah Jane, just to see like the insight, I guess, your insight or your perspective into, um, you know, the connection between art and science. And there are so many parallels, like you mentioned, that the curiosity, um, wonder, imagination, exploration, and even down to the hands, like, <laughs> you know, there's so many parallels there. So it was awesome to to be able to, yeah, do this with you. So thanks so much. <laughs> that was beautiful, Lot. Thank you so much. So I might just hand back over to you, Sarah Jane. I know you have to run for school pickup. So did you want to do a quick wrap, wrap up? Um, <laughs> um, in my language, we say Wulaka and it's a deeply stolen language and so i would like everybody across the world across the globe um to honor me with palawa wulaka wulaka thank you so much sir thanks sj thanks sj beautiful thanks sj such an honor thank you and thanks, Lauren, thanks for joining also, us. Thanks, Lauren, for joining in across the oceans. You can get to sleep now, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good night, everyone. <laughs> All right, so I think that wraps up our middle session for today. Um, we'll go, we are finishing slightly early, so we've got about a 45-minute break. 
um, and we'll start the afternoon session at 3.30 Australian Eastern Standard Time. So thanks everyone. Thank you all the presenters um, from the oral presentations to the rapid fire presentations. And of course, Sarah Jane and Lauren, um, thank you for an awesome session and we'll see you back again soon. Thanks, Eric.